Good afternoon. I'm Jamie Chesney with the U.S. Indian Political Action Committee, the voice of, of over 2.8 million Indian Americans. We're here today with Congressman Ed Whitfield from the 1st District of Kentucky. As Chairman of the House Subcommittee on Energy and Power, Congressman Whitfield has been instrumental in tapping the limitless supplies of energy in the American oil and gas field. It is our pleasure today to conduct this interview with Congressman Ed Whitfield. Congressman Whitfield, thank you for being with us today. Our first question is, as the Chairman of the House Subcommittee on Energy and Power, how do you think America can capitalize on its vast energy reserves? Well, you know, that's one of the major issues facing America today. We have uh, such an abundance of natural resources because of the shale gas development of oil and natural gas. And uh, all of the energy information agencies, uh, international as well as domestic, say that America can be the number one producer of oil and natural gas within the next very few years. In fact, I guess we're number one already, maybe in natural gas production. So we have a great opportunity, and the greatest obstacle that we face right now, uh, many of it comes from the present administration in Washington, D.C., through regulatory barriers. So we have a unique opportunity, and uh, the number one problem facing us are unreasonable regulatory barriers. Large deposits of untapped shale oil and gas can be found in your district and across Kentucky. How do you think LNG exports would benefit the people you represent? And as a co-sponsor of HR6, how would that bill help America, your district, and the natural gas industry to grow? Well, I think the, the American people in general, whether you're from Kentucky or wherever you might be from, would benefit from the export of liquefied natural gas. Uh, as you may or may not know, there are about 26 applications pending before regulatory bodies in America today uh, to obtain the approval to export liquefied natural gas. Uh, you must get the approval from the Department of Energy for the export or import of natural gas, and you have to get the approval from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for the siting and the building of the facilities, the physical facilities to do it. So it's a two-step process, and even though we have these 26 applications that have been pending for some time, there's only we've only had two approvals by both FERC and the Department of Energy, and there's only one site that actual construction has already started, and that's at the Chenier plant down in Louisiana. So the American, I believe it's been shown through hearings that the American people would benefit greatly from the export of liquefied natural gas, and we believe that other parts of the world, because we have government leaders coming to talk to us frequently. As you know, we had a hearing about this. India was one of the countries that participated in our forum, and they all are telling us that they urge us to uh, begin the export of liquefied natural gas uh, to assist them lower their prices, and certainly in Europe, they do not want to have to rely as much on Russia as they are today. With America's ener energy demand growing larger every year, how do you think natural gas could help America meet this demand? Well, uh, liquefied natural gas uh, can play a vital role, primarily because it's happening not so much because of the additional production, although that's vitally important, but it's happening primarily because of regulatory decisions by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. As you know, President Obama is of the opinion that the number one problem facing mankind today is not poverty or health care issues or economic issues, but he thinks it's climate change. So his uh, EPA has been particularly aggressive, and for example, it will be, it's impossible to build a new coal plant in America because there's no technology available to meet the emission standards that this administration has set. In addition, uh, in June, they, they want to finalize uh, a rule on existing coal-fired plants, so many of those would be closed down. So out of necessity, 
uh, we do need natural gas because we will not be able to meet our uh, electricity demands uh, without uh, natural gas. Uh, one thing is certain, uh, there are, you can't build enough windmills or solar panels to meet the electricity needs of America and we do have to rely on base load and that's, we have to have coal and we have to have natural gas to meet that uh, demand. In light of the $400 billion deal signed between Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping and the recent crisis in Ukraine, how do you think the United States can use energy exports as a responsible instrument for foreign policy? Well, I don't know that that would be our priority to use it as a foreign policy. Uh, we know, as I said earlier, there have been so many representatives of foreign countries who've come and pleaded with us to step up our efforts to export uh, natural gas. And uh, so we definitely want to do that. But it's going to happen, if it happens at all, uh, because of a free market system. And there's great demand around the world for uh, liquefied natural gas. There are many reasons for that, too, because you have organizations like the Export Bank in the United States, the World Bank, uh, the Asian Development Bank, and others. They won't, will not even talk about providing money for a coal plant, even though many countries come to us and say, you know, the technology is there to burn coal much cleaner than we have in the past, but they can't get the money for it, so they're being required to go to natural gas, which certainly is cleaner, uh, but it is a fossil fuel. Uh, so uh, we're excited about the opportunity of natural gas in America, both domestically and also for export. Currently, the Department of Energy requires lengthy export applications to companies seeking to export liquefied natural gas to nations without free trade agreements with the U.S. Do you think that some, some of this is necessary regulation or simply government intrusion into the free markets? Well, I mean, I, I think it's basically government intrusion in the free market because I mean, we do have free trade agreements with a lot of countries, and as you say, there's a difference in a free trade country and a non-free trade country. But we want to be in a position uh, to send natural gas wherever the marketplace needs it and at a price uh, that is affordable and yet provides sufficient funds for a reasonable return on our side. So uh, I, I think it's our goal uh, to set up enough uh, export facilities that natural gas can go around the world where it's most needed and hopefully we'll be able to compete in the marketplace with other producers of natural gas, wherever they may be. What are some of the critical challenges you foresee in the United States, India, liquefied natural gas trade? And how do you think the two countries can overcome these challenges? Well, I think the biggest challenge is, number one, getting the approval from the U.S. government. As I said, we've got 26 or 27 applications. Only one plant is under construction. Only two have been approved by both the DOE and the FERC. So the number one obstacle that we face is uh, trying to expedite the regulatory process in the United States. Uh, second of all, uh, once that's done, even on the Chenier plant, it's going to take a number of years to construct these facilities. And then number three, you've got to enter into the contracts with the consumers and you've got to work out a price that makes it uh, uh, realistic to use. So. Uh, so regulatory, uh, time to construct, and uh, just setting the contracts in place are just some practical problems that we're going to have to deal with. But I think both countries are committed to trying to do that, and uh, I'm optimistic that it will happen soon. How do you think India's new Prime Minister Narendra Modi will impact U.S.-India relations? Well, I, I think that uh, the United States has always recognized the importance of India, and I think that we've uh, always had a reasonably good relationship with India, and I think that everything that I've read about him indicates that he has broad support in India. Even the business leaders seem to be supportive of him. 
so I think uh, the United States is looking forward to work with, the, with him and his government in addressing a wide spectrum of issues, whether it be energy or national security or commerce, whatever it might be. Do you have any message for U.S. impact members regarding our ef efforts to influence U.S. India energy policy? Well, I would just say that uh, it is vitally important to participate in the political system, and that's what a political action committee is all about. And uh, I'm delighted that uh, the India PAC uh, has been established and that you have people who are supportive of it because that's the way the American political system works. Uh, so if you're not a player, then even though you might have a valid argument, good points to make, strong uh, advocacy issues relating to India, uh, if you're not a participant, uh, then it makes it more difficult to convey those ideas in a meaningful way to people who actually can have a great impact on the uh, issues that you're dealing with. Congressman Whitfield, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.